All right, let's get this started. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening to my uh, panelists here, uh, Ambassador D.P. Venkatesh Varma and Ambassador Sayyad Akbaruddin. Uh, before we start off, I'll quickly uh, introduce uh, the concept of Let's Talk Policy. At Kautalya School of Public Policy, we do a series called Let's Talk Policy, uh, which basically means getting the nuanced perspective, getting the interesting takes, and getting the experts to speak uh, on, on a fact evidence-based uh, sort of method. Uh, this is not about noise. This is about pure learning and pure facts and evidence being talked about and from the experienced people. So if you are here today with us, thank you so much for joining in. Over the next one hour, we're going to sort of piece by piece understand in depth about the Russia-Ukraine uh, uh, crisis, or should I say the Russia-Ukraine war uh, at this point. Uh, before we start, I'll quickly introduce myself. I am Prateek Kamal. I'm the co-founder of Kautalya School of Public Policy. Kautalya School of Public Policy is a state-of-the-art public policy school based out of Hyderabad. Uh, we offer a two years master's program in public policy uh, for which we are accepting applications as of now until 15th of March. Uh, so if you are an applicant today, this is your chance to get to know the school uh, in, in depth. Uh, before I go forward, I'll quickly introduce my panelists for today. Uh, we have panelists who have actually done this work in the field and are coming from that perspective. Uh, to my uh, right, so as to say here is Ambassador D.B. Venkatesh Varma. He spent about three tenures over span of three decades in Russia, uh, you know, taking India interest forward in Russia. And he retired last year uh, in October as the former, uh, as the ambassador of India to Russia. Uh, to my left is Ambassador Sayyad Agbaruddin, uh, fondly called as the Dean at Kautalya School of Public Policy now, but he has career spanning in multilaterals. Most recently, he was the former uh, representative of India to the United Nation. And now he's been the guard of public policy at Kautalya and is teaching the next generation of public policy uh, students about international relations. Uh, thank you so much, uh, my uh, panelists, for joining us today. Uh, my first sort of question, uh, to you, Ambassador uh, Venkatesh Varma, is uh, could you help us understand the the background of this uh, U.S. Uh, sorry, uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis? Right? What is the background? Is it a new thing? Is it a historical thing? Uh, what is it that? What are the nuts and bolts in history when we look at uh, wh what led us to this place today? Right? And I know you've done this similar session for students of uh, master students in Kautalya. So I'll I'll quickly ask you to sort of for the larger audience, set the background for this uh, entire crisis. Yeah, Pratik, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to, um, uh, to speak at your panel. Uh, uh, delighted to be here. Of course, uh, the Russia-Ukraine uh, problem is an old problem. It has several layers, uh, several uh, uh, roots and layers of uh, both uh, positive interaction and of conflict that has evolved over history. But of course, the latest phase is uh, that Russia uh, uh, used uh, military force uh, for the last uh, fortnight or so, a very in a very substantial manner. Uh, it has been called war, uh, Russia-Ukraine war. It's also been called uh, a Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. Uh, of course, uh, the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine uh, has been, uh, that's a red line that has been crossed. Uh, Russia and Ukraine, of course, are uh, the, the people of Russia and Ukraine come from the same land. Uh, they come from the same land between the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea. Uh, they are intertwined people, uh, two nationalities whose histories have uh, come together and have uh, gone on separate paths throughout history. Uh, they were under the yoke of uh, Mongol domination for a couple of centuries in the 13th and 14th century. Uh, they uh, were under the, uh, or they were part of the Russian Empire, uh, the Tsarist Empire. Briefly, between 1917 and 1921, Ukraine became an independent state, uh, um, but that was incorporated back into the Soviet Union is one of the founding republics of the Soviet Union in 1922. Of course, when the Soviet Union broke up in 1991, uh, between 1991 and now, uh, Ukraine is a sovereign, independent uh, country. Uh, however, the 
uh, Ukrainian and Russian people have, as I said, intertwined histories. Uh, they come from the slave, uh, the, uh, the same uh, Slavic tradition. Uh, they have uh, similar um, roots in terms of culture. Uh, the languages are pretty similar. They're not identical. Uh, they are pretty similar. Uh, they have a common historical experience. There's a huge amount of intermarriage. Uh, their literatures are similar. Their cult uh, the church uh, relations are also uh, are also pretty close. So I think uh, when there is conflict that emerges between two intertwined peoples, um, and the conflict assumes a very special and a very sharp character, and unfortunately we are seeing it uh, play out in the world uh, before us. Uh, the war itself, I think, can be traced back to um, a number of uh, uh, events that have taken place since 2014. Uh, Russia has been very sensitive about uh, what happens in Ukraine. The, in the Russian view, the forceful overthrow of the democratically elected government of President Yanukovych in 2014 uh, set in place uh, a series of events uh, that have led to do, uh, today. I mean, uh, of course, the uh, the incorporation of Crimea into Russia is one of them. Uh, Western influence uh, and the strong uh, tendency of Ukraine to seek uh, NATO membership, uh, NATO preparations, NATO level preparations that were taking place in Ukraine in the last three, four years, uh, American and uh, European military aid to um, to Russia. Russia has always said that it is a red line for um, NATO membership would be a red line for Russia. Uh, there were some attempts at negotiation between um, between Russia and Ukraine through the Minsk uh, agreement and the Normandy format. There were also some aspects of uh, dialogue between Russia and the United States and Russia and the European Union on Ukraine. Uh, all these came to came to naught. So unfortunately, uh, through the exhaustion, say, of uh, the diplomatic means of uh, negotiation, of settling this problem, uh, war has come about. Uh, war has come about, I think, because largely on account of the fact that both sides, both on the Russian side and Ukraine, supported by the United States and the EU and NATO, uh, both sides are making maximalist demands. Um, there is no... Uh, um, tendency or willingness to show accommodation. And the war is proceeding today because both sides are not willing to talk. Of course, as the military situation changes, I guess, and I hope that there'll be accommodation and compromise on both sides. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador, for your uh, opening remark. Now I, I uh, sort of switch gears and, and move to uh, Ambassador Sayed Akruddin. Uh, so if you can just explain, uh, given your vast experience uh, dealing with multilaterals, uh, what is the multilateral take on it? What is the take on, on from the UN side? What is the take on NATO side? A lot of, lot of memes and jokes have come around on the role played by the UN. Uh, given that you were in the thick of things uh, in, in UN, uh, what do you have to say about uh, the criticism which has come the multilateral way uh, uh, over the last uh, fortnight? Um, so, Pratik, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, raising an issue, which is uh, uh, a genuine concern of what is happening, because every time there is an issue of this sort, uh, where there are uh, concerns of uh, military hostilities, everybody looks at the UN. Um, and it's normal. Uh, that said, I think we need to understand the philosophical underpinning of the United Nations itself and its primary organ, which handles peace and security. And that's the Security Council in this uh, instance. The Security Council, the way it is framed, the way it is structured, is a instrument that is designed not to tackle conflicts between big powers. Its uh, primary goal in the wake of World War II was to ensure that there would not be another configuration that uh, encompasses the world. So by design, they've worked out a system that you cannot have a outcome in the Security Council when one of the big powers is involved because the fear was if you push that down uh, the line, 
you will have a global configuration. So by design, the United Nations Security Council does not provide solutions for issues where the permanent members' core interests are involved. It provides solutions where other interests can be accommodated. Um, on core interests, uh, it's not the right forum. We need to have an alternate forum. So those who are, are raising questions uh, are right in saying that perhaps this is not a forum for discussion because you see, in today's age, the primary focus is what? It's on dissemination of public information. Uh, now, if you have a public forum which is designed to uh, um, uh, in an age where public dissemination of information is key, then it's not going to be a forum where quiet diplomacy can take place. It's going to be a forum where showmanship rather than statesmanship will be uh, the primary concern because people are not speaking to each other nor at each other, they're speaking to different audiences. They're speaking to audiences in their homeland. They're speaking to audiences across the world. So unfortunately, that's what we are seeing. And that's what um, is clearly evident. And you are not going to find solutions there. You need spaces which are quieter, uh, where quiet diplomacy can take place. And Security Council is not that place uh, and it will not address or resolve issues of this nature uh, on that platform. And let's be very clear and candid about it. Sure. I'll just probe this line of thought a little bit, right? Ukraine feels that they've been left high and dry, right? That the world which stopped them from going nuclear, right, has not come to their rescue. What does this talk about the rules-based you know, international framework, like it was always based on certain ground rules, right? Is that ground really shaky now? And what's the future of rules-based international order? Uh, both of you can give a take on like it. Varma? Yeah, of course. Uh, the first rule of a rules-based international order is that mm -hmm. might is not right. Uh, because every other rule flows from the fact that you cannot settle uh, international relations uh, only on the basis of military force. Unfortunately, therefore, when there is an occurrence of war between two states, the first casualty of a rules-based international order is that rule that might is not right. But however, we need to see it in a, in a broader context. Uh, conflicts do not arise out of a vacuum. Uh, wars do not occur overnight. Uh, this particular problem between Ukraine and Russia has been a problem that has been brewing for almost two decades. Ukraine sought NATO membership in 2002. Today, it's 2022. 20 years later, its pursuit of foreign policy of which a central pillar is the membership of NATO has brought it not to the brink of war, but it is in the midst of war. So if the pursuit of foreign policy is to protect your national interests, also in the context of the protection of its civilians and the well-being of its people, obviously on that yardstick, this has been a failure of Ukrainian policy. At the same time, one of the principles of good foreign policy is that you conduct your relations with your neighbors in a manner that your neighbors themselves do not feel threatened and seek resort to measures which are extreme and which may finally be impractical. So therefore, by getting into a situation where they have no other option but to use massive military force and conduct a war in Ukraine, means that the neighborhood policy of Russia has also been a failure. It's also been uh, uh, a failure of uh, intentions and a failure of outcomes, because uh, whatever is the result of the, of the war. 
From the Russian point of view, of course, uh, they point out the fact that the Minsk agreement and the Normandy format were uh, scuttled both by Ukraine and by the European powers. They also make the point that European security was degraded over a period of time by the American withdrawal of important international agreements such as the ABM Treaty, the INF Treaty, the Center, the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty, the CFE Treaty, and most recently the Open Sky Treaty. So there are several fundamental uh, arms control treaties that were there, and also the Russia NATO uh, Pact of 1997. But let us be clear: the relations between big powers has to be a balance of interests needs to be maintained, which need to be underwritten by good productive uh, agreements. And these agreements have to be implemented in a spirit of give and take and of mutual accommodation. The American argument is that Russia has been uh, very threatening towards Ukraine. The Russian argument is that Russian interests in Europe after the end of the Cold War have not been accommodated. So there are complaints on both sides, but there is no doubt that the war in Ukraine today is the result of the mismanagement and the miscalculation amongst the big powers, which has happened over the last 20 years. It's a tragedy. The biggest uh, uh, risk that has happened to the rules-based international order is that we are in a free-for-all, uh, which is not good. I think the international community needs to come back together to bring back the fundamental principles, which is the protection of uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity, but also underwritten by mutual accommodation of interests between, uh, between various powers. So that is the main lesson that I would draw from the ongoing uh, war in Ukraine. I'll come to Ambassador Akrudin. Uh, you mentioned very interesting uh, point uh, in the morning when we were having a chat, saying that uh, there was an uh, unwritten uh, rule which said that or rather it was assumed that two countries with McDonald's don't fight with each other, right? Does that still hold true or is it going to be an era of bully, bullying, an era of the, you know, the, the financial might uh, of a country uh, forcing itself to do whatever they want, right? Free for all as uh, Ambassador Varma was pointing it out. So where do we see, what is the future, right? If you were to sort of predict the future uh, as a soothsayer, what would you say uh, is, is going to happen? Um, so Pratik, if I was a soothsayer, I would be playing the Satta Bazaar rather than responding to you. Uh, that said, um, you're right about certain um, uh, the fraying of norms. And let me uh, address your question in that context. Ambassador Varma said there were a whole series of agreements which were fraying or which have been um, consciously disregarded over a period of time. Um, Let's reverse it and see how in the last 20 days, how what we thought were norms have now been, um, have are now changing and evolving, right? They are evolving in response to a military hostility. However, they have spread from the battleground to the financial markets, from the financial markets to the banking system, to economic measures against uh, uh, purchase of equipment or resources from Russia, for example, oil or gas, to uh, the sporting arena. So now, uh, if you are um, in a conflict situation uh, with another country, it is fair game now not to, uh, to assemble a coalition which does not play with them or uh, to ban their artists. So if you look, the battleground of what were norms has fundamentally expanded. Uh, it's a new situation that we are facing that uh, conflict is no longer what is restricted on the battlefield, but it's in new arenas. Uh, if I may say, uh, there is a weaponization of various other elements which we hadn't seen. Uh, this is a new game. It's uh, something that all of us need to watch out. Coming back to McDonald's, I would end by saying McDonald's has suddenly stopped functioning in Russia. So perhaps that norm stays 
of two countries with McDonald's don't fight each other, but it evaporated long ago when NATO bombed Kosovo. Serbia had McDonald's, so did every NATO company, uh, every NATO country. Yet that norm was violated long ago. Uh, it's a good, uh, nice little peg to hang on, hang on, but in reality, things are different. Countries pursue their interests, not whether McDonald's, uh, Big Mac is uh, uh, sold in some place or the other. So let's leave that aside. Uh, international relations is much more sophisticated a, doc, uh, a subject than to judge by where Mc, Big Macs are sold. Great. Uh, so let, let's, let's come back to the important point of uh, sanctions. You mentioned a lot about that economic impact, right? I want to sort of <laughs> probe that line of thought a little bit and understand from you, does sanction work? And specifically in this case, would sanctions work and what would be the impact or the cascading impact on the rest of the world's economy? So a quick reply to you is, um, um, we are in the era of what they said 10 years ago or so were smart sanctions. But we know however smart sanctions are, they are not smart enough not to impact on human beings. So whatever the level of uh, sanctions that are uh, going to be imposed or are being imposed will willy-nilly impact. Uh, the question is, what is the time frame? How long does it take and what is the impact? It did not deter any um, effort, uh, the outbreak of hostilities. Now, what's it? If it could not deter, will it change? Uh, policy. Uh, history is replete with instances that sanctions have not fundamentally changed uh, policies of countries, including countries which were following egregious policies like the apartheid uh, regime in South Africa. Uh, that said, <laughs> sanctions do have an impact. Uh, and the present uh, uh, type of sanctions may well have very crippling uh, impacts. Um, and when uh, economies are under crippling impact, it is the less well-to-do and the more vulnerable who will be impacted. Uh, so make no mistake, sanctions have an impact. We are seeing it already. Uh, Brent prices have gone up to near um, uh, uh, highest levels that we are, have known for. So uh, it is likely to have an impact on, macro, on the macroeconomy of many countries in terms of inflation, in terms of foreign exchange reserves, in terms of how uh, growth is going to take place. A lot of countries were looking at prospects of coming out of COVID and rapid economic uh, growth. Uh, to think that these sort of sanctions are not going to be impacted would not be correct. They are going to impact, but whether they are going to change foreign policy, um, I leave that only for history to decide, but looking back in the rear view mirror, there are few instances where fundamentally countries have changed their foreign policy and Russia uh, is a country with a long history, um, a, a strong economy, a large uh, reserves, uh, yet all these will be impacted, but I'm not too certain whether the impact is uh, going to lead to change in direction. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll snob, get us closer home and talk about India's interest, right? Uh, and what has been the talk of the town or the buzz in India, even during the last two phases of uh, UP elections, it even entered the speeches, uh, you know, in India. So there is domestic consumption. I want to talk about this issue of evacuation. And here, both of you have experience of dealing with evacuations before. Uh -huh. So, you know, I'll, I'll first ask this question to Ambassador Verma, and then I'll ask your experience of evacuation. But, you know, what is the standard operating procedure for evacuation? How have you dealt before this? Uh, how has India managed evacuations in before? And what is your take on the evacuation scenario right now? You, I, I've, I've asked a pretty loaded question. You can break it into parts, right? And But we'd love to hear your personal experience of dealing with evacuations during your foreign service tenure. Ambassador Verma. Well, <clears throat> let's start with the good and happy news, which is that the students from Sumi presently are traveling in a train uh, uh, in uh, Western Ukraine and will soon exit 
uh, the war zone and will be in Poland and they'll be taking a flight home. Uh, the country is absolutely relieved and delighted uh, that this set of students who uh, went through a very uh, difficult phase with great courage and fortitude are will now be back home uh, very soon. Uh, and the one student who was unfortunately injured in an armed attack, uh, he also is safe and he is now admitted into hospital and undergoing treatment. So this has been an evacuation, Operation Ganga has been an evacuation from a very active war zone. Uh, so it is a tremendous achievement uh, for India to pull back all its nationals and all its students from very, very difficult circumstances. And this has involved the intervention at the highest level. Uh, Prime Minister Modi spoke to President Putin three, four times. He spoke to President Zelensky. Um, our foreign ministry has been in touch with uh, uh, several uh, foreign countries. Uh, four cabinet level ministers uh, have been in the neighborhood. Uh, so uh, no, no effort has been spared in, 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 in bringing back our students. There have been previous instances where uh, we have evacuated uh, our nationals from active war zones. Yemen is one of them. Libya is another. Uh, I think uh, in the end, I think India performs exceedingly well. Uh, there is a coming together of resources, of planning, uh, of effort, uh, not just by the Ministry of External Affairs, but several ministries. Our airlines go in. Uh, everybody pitches in. Uh, so the whole country has watched... Uh, uh, with great concern how this has unfolded in the last two weeks. But I must say it's a matter of great relief and great satisfaction and that Operation Ganga has been a very good success. Ambassador Akrudin, your take on the evacuation process and the standard operating procedures we followed in the past? Um, Pratik, um, every evacuation is unique uh, because the challenges are different. If I could quickly relate a couple of my own experiences. Uh, last time I was involved in one was uh, Operation Rahat in Yemen. Uh, this was in 2015. I was at the Ministry of External Affairs headquarters. Um, it was a different scenario. Uh, again, a war zone, a situation where the Indian Navy, the Indian Air Force and Air India worked together um, uh, the airport in Yemen, in Sana'a, was uh, under uh, 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 closure because Saudi Arabia had air superiority. Yet, we were able to work out um, a via media where there was a window opened for Indian uh, planes to go in, uh, pick up Indian nationals and fly from there to Djibouti, which was the hub and um, General Vike Singh. Uh, was um, uh, overseeing that operation from Djibouti. Uh, uh, also, Indian naval ships uh, went into Aden and rescued not only Indians, but several other nationalities um, uh, who were stranded there. Um, that was a different situation, yet we performed well. Um, again, uh, as Ambassador Verma has explained, this is a, a unique situation of a very different kind we've again performed well. And Indian, uh, the uh, Indian government has a approach to evacuations which could ca be called the all of society approach because it's not only the Ministry of External Affairs or the Ministry of Civil Aviation or the Ministry of Defense that are involved. Everybody is involved and you've seen the whole nation was watching what was happening here. I, as a young diplomat, saw this when I cut my treat uh, in the evacuation in Kuwait. Um, that was my first exposure to the immense difficulties that uh, human beings undergo in zones of conflict. Um, people had to travel something like 1,400 kilometers uh, without public transport. They were hitchhiking, they were getting onto vehicles, they were uh, um, uh, trying to manage in difficult situations with no water, um, the muscles of uh, bread, which they had to survive for the 1400 kilometers, cars breaking down. Uh, it was uh, every evacuation is a human tragedy uh, because the exodus of thousands is not a 
situation that occurs uh, uh, more than once in a lifetime for most individuals and fortunately it should not be in any individual's lifetime. So the Indian um, system has experience of handling these difficult, unique situations and that also showed now where uh, we've been extremely successful as Ambassador Verma has said, uh, standard operating procedures are there. However, the uniqueness of situations uh, varies and innovation um, uh, initiative uh, and um, independence and quick judgments are key in successful uh, 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 evacuations. And that's been proved once again uh, in Ukraine. So before I uh, get into the questions, there are a lot of them which have sort of come in. One last question with to Ambassador Verma. Given your uh, you know, deep experience of uh, dealing with economic ties uh, between India and Russia, I'd love to understand uh, what is it that's going to happen to the trade between India and Russia? There have been speculations that India will have a separate window on, on ruble, uh, rupee trading. Uh, you know, I don't know it's, if it's possible, given the complexities involved. But given that you've been at the forefront of managing uh, the Indian economic interest in Russia, uh, what is it that's going to sort of happen now, given the scenario of war? Uh, Pratik, let's be clear. <clears throat> this is a war taking place in Ukraine, but it is not a conflict limited to Ukraine. It is now a conflict which is having global impact global impact for the reason that it is not only being fought at the level of uh, regular armaments, uh, you know, military means, uh, tanks, planes and artillery and things like that. But there is a very strong cyber dimension. There is an information war also going on. And there is a huge economic conflict taking place on in the system of sanctions being imposed on Russia. And it is not just uh, sanctions imposed on Russia, it is also on their banking system. Uh, a large sectors of their economy have been cut off, transportation links have been cut off. So it is not uh, impact just uh, on India itself, but the globe as a whole. Of course, we have about $10 billion worth of uh, um, bilateral trade every year annually. We have a huge uh, defense relationship. We also interact in terms of energy, nuclear energy. We have very good space cooperation, scientific cooperation, and all these sectors uh, are important for us. However, this is these type of sanctions that have been imposed on Russia are quite unprecedented. These are new and uncharted waters for everyone, for those imposing these sanctions and those uh, which uh, those sanctions have been imposed on. The previous methods that we have, uh, experience we have, is with respect to uh, sanctions with respect to Iran on their oil, oil exports. And some mechanisms were worked out in a manner that protected India's interests. But those were sector-specific, uh, commodity-specific, and Iran was a much smaller case. However, this is a much larger issue uh, we also have to be uh, cognizant of the law of unintended consequences. You might impose sanctions on one area, but the effects will be there on somewhere else. Uh, in relation to the sanctions that have been imposed on the SWIFT, on the Russian Central Bank, uh, the banking system has now become uh, almost uh, defunct. Uh, but for India, I think our protection of our national interest, of our economic interest is paramount. I think the big powers can have their fights, but we are we should not be asked to carry the risks and the costs of a big power uh, confrontation in Europe. So I think we would need to put in place mechanisms uh, which are uh, consistent with our interests. Uh, we cannot uh, be in a position where there are sanctions have a paralyzing effect on our economic activity. And I think as we go along, and I'm sure the government will take a view in a manner that our core interests, uh, not just with Russia, but with the international system as a whole, uh, will be protected. For example, if we are to fly to Europe, we know we uh, flights going through the Russian airspace 
will not be able to go to Europe. Uh, flights to Russia themselves are now only through Iran. So this is also restricting and adding costs to our economic activity. So I think this is an aspect that needs to be highlighted. Uh, there are increasing collateral costs to the international economy. Um, um, Ambassador Akbaruddin mentioned inflation, uh, the price in oil prices. Inflation will cut and uh, uh, into our uh, economic growth. So the impact is very widespread and very serious. And uh, we are not immune to this, but I think we should stand up and be counted for protecting our own interests. Great, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, that's it from the uh, from my side. Uh, this is a platform wherein we encourage uh, you know uh, our audience to come in and interact uh, you know face to face one on one. Uh, the only advice I have is keep the questions short. Uh, there are no follow ups because there are a lot of questions involved. And please uh, you know tell who do you want uh, to be heard from, which of the panelists, right? Uh, uh, so can we bring on uh, Ila Joshi? Thanks, Ila, for joining us. Uh, you can um, ask a question. Thank you. Yeah, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Good evening, sir. So uh, thank you. First of all, thanks a lot for such a, you know, giving a very uh, brief and very so it was quite interesting to hear something in very simple language for the first time because everyone... So, so my question is that when we talk about Russia, I mean, will it be right to say that despite of, you know, in the early, in the, in the initial stages of the war, Russia was, you know, we were not sure what Putin is going to do. It was more of a phony war. But then we saw that suddenly there was this uh, active military engagement happening. And uh, in today's time, uh, in contemporary times, when you think of war, it is something a very big thing to happen. So is it is it somewhere, can we see it as a Russian attempt to, uh, Russian, actually it's a Russian attempt, a desperate attempt on part of Russia to reclaim its lost superpower status in the international politics. Secondly, sir, I would also like to know that, what's your opinion on um, this ongoing India's stand, India's foreign policy, calling it as uh, non-alignment 2.0? So how do you think that India is faring as far as its foreign policy is concerned in, 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 uh, in the context of this ongoing uh, struggle, power struggle? Thank you. And who do you want uh, this question? Uh, anyone, anyone can ask. Yes. Okay. Uh, can Thank we you. hear Ambassador Akhruddin uh, and if there's a follow-up, Ambassador Barma can <laughs> So let's take um, the second question and uh, Ambassador Verma can um, uh, respond to the, uh, uh, the first one. Um, you can call it by any name, but uh, what India is demonstrating in the present instance is that uh, we are pursuing our uh, goals and objectives in a very difficult situation. It's a situation which is not of our making. It's a situation where we have only a limited role. Yet, as Ambassador Varma mentioned, and as, as I have told earlier, it has implications for us in multifaceted ways. So this is the situation we are facing. And what we are trying to do is to maintain an independence of st uh, independent stance. So what's the way that in which we are communicating this? Uh, in the big picture, if you look at the big picture and say, um, India is uh, supporting uh, uh, fully with uh, Russia, the answer perhaps is not so. Uh, look at the votes at the UN. Uh, Russia has been voting no to every effort at the UN. Uh, our approach has been to abstain based on a case-by-case -case analysis of what is being put forth. So for example, uh, at the Human Rights Council, we abstained uh, on the grounds that uh, uh, we have not only now, but in the past, not been supportive of an approach which is uh, going to start a uh, um, commission of inquiry. So if we look at several other instances where commissions of inquiry were set up, um, in none of these we uh, voted in support. 
so we've been consistent on a separate specific issue irrespective of what the country uh, concern was because we have serious um, philosophical uh, questions about how the international community approaches uh, this issue of commissions of inquiry number one let's move to the statements that we are making increasingly and we've made several statements at the united nations in the security council by my count maybe about six or seven so you can see at every statement we are gradually evolving our situation initially we had called as you had said for a return to diplomacy and dialogue and that's the normal thing to do in a conflict situation having seen that uh, uh, as the situation evolved things had changed and as you rightly put it they seem to be more than what was meeting the eye initially we started saying other things uh, um, like we say that we support um in the, uh, sorry um territorial integrity uh, and sovereignty uh, obviously if you look back and see whose territorial integrity is being um threatened whose sovereignty is being threatened certainly not uh, of russia so without saying so we are tacitly indicating that there is a uh, transgression of some cardinal principles of international law similarly we said we regret the outbreak of hostilities what does that mean uh, as you yourself said the hostilities started with a precipitate action whatever is the historical background to it it started with a precipitate action by the russian federation and us saying that we regret it means that we now are uh, regretting that action without condemning uh, in as many words so there are several such instances i can quote where we have made our position clear humanitarian assistance so who are we providing humanitarian assistance to to the ukrainian side um if we don't have empathy concern support for a side we don't provide uh, humanitarian assistance so you can see several ways in which we are nuancing our position it shows at a granular level there are evolution which you may not notice it from a bigger picture uh, because you are seeing um, abstention after abstention after abstention but if abstention serves our purpose based on a granular examination of the situation um, that may is the right uh, approach uh, we are not in this uh, for purposes of uh, commentary we are not in this for purposes of public diplomacy we are in this for pursuit of some national interest and broad principles which we've articulated are being uh, infringed upon well uh, with respect to the first question asked by ila uh, <clears throat> on whether there is a element of desperation in russian policy of course an act of war and use of military force is always an extreme step for the last uh, six or seven months from june of last year there was a summit between president putin and president biden in geneva uh, starting from december last year uh, until late uh, january uh, russia followed a dual track approach which is to mobilize its troops but also keep the door open for dialogue and even as the war is proceeding uh, russia and ukraine have talked three times already and there is a process of uh, engagement while the war is going on so this dual track approach has always been there now the question that is being asked is whether the dual track approach is yielding any results the answer is no uh, whether the russian objective earlier objective of mobilizing troops to find a satisfactory solution to its security problem that it sees in nato expanding into ukraine was found the answer is no uh, let us be clear that russia has always said that ukraine joining nato, uh, nato is a red line it's an existential issue for it so there may, there may have been a miscalculation on part of the uh, of the west of nato and the united states to see how important it was for russia but it is i think is also a miscalculation on part of russia 
to think that its primary security problem in its neighborhood with respect to Ukraine can be solved only through the use of force. And it's unlikely. Um, war never is yields clean solutions. War is always messy. There is a, always an issue of uh, you start somewhere in, in a war, you always end up in a place where you, it was not planned. And uh, there will be the tragedy is that European security has now collapsed almost completely. Uh, the instability from Europe is now spreading all over the world. Uh, we are not immune to this. Uh, I don't think Russia is intending to create, create the Soviet Union. It had a specific problem in its neighborhood. It is trying to solve it uh, through the use of force. Uh, it is we, the situation is rather pessimistic. Uh, clean solutions don't come, but we'll wait and wait and watch how the military situation proceeds, because a lot of the uh, diplomatic outcome will proceed from the fact whether Russia is able to bring this military operations to a quick end, or there'll be a stalemate and the war morphs into something else. Uh, can we bring in Ravi Kumar Varma, please? Hi, Ravi, can you hear us? Ravi? I think we're having issues bringing in Ravi. Till then, can we, can we hear from Shrikar Srivastava? Okay, I think uh, Shrikar has also left us. Uh, Venkata Badrinath, please. Yes, sir. Hi, Venkata, please go ahead. Sir, I have some specific questions about the evacuation process. Sir, I just wanted to know why the Indian government or the Indian authorities have been very successful at evacuations and compared to the other countries, sir. Um, um, Ravi, uh, um, what you've raised is a question of how India sees its diaspora. Um, India sees its diaspora as integral to its aspirations of becoming a better society. Uh, let's not forget uh, what has been the enormous contribution of India's young diaspora uh, to uh, our growth as a uh, our visibility on the global stage, uh, our growth as a country. Um, if you look at, say, the remittances that are coming in to, uh, annually to India, uh, we are the country which receives 80 billion approximately as uh, remittances. Uh, you can see the umbilical cord between India and Indians overseas. Um, there are such strong linkages because uh, we are way ahead of any other country where Indians overseas are repatriating remittances, number one. And number two, uh, many young Indians who have gone out have changed the notion that uh, India is only a land of tigers and uh, um, 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 magicians, etc. Today, uh, look at the Indian diaspora success uh, in the IT field. Uh, they have changed the image of India outside, number two. Number three, a um, large number of uh, Indians in the Gulf have been uh, showcases of how diligence, uh, hard work, and uh, discipline uh, is appreciated uh, uh, among those countries um, uh, and has created a niche for Indians abroad. Uh, now, if these are the benefits that accrue to India uh, from its diaspora, it behoves India as a democracy to be responsive, receptive to the needs of our people abroad. We have a long tradition of ensuring that our diaspora, uh, when in need, uh, can find a dependable um, uh, out uh, a, a dependable uh, uh, 
a partner in the government which reaches out and uh, extends a helping hand. Uh, uh, perhaps it's also a reflection of the democratic values that governments uh, have generally pursued in this. So there could be a multiplicity of reasons, but it's just a reflection of government's uh, need to be responsible responsive to its citizens uh, beyond the, uh, uh, their borders, because uh, in difficult situations, in war zones, there is nobody else except uh, the hope that governments can uh, work out solutions uh, for people who are uh, who suddenly find themselves uh, in extremely difficult uh, situations where hostilities are being undertaken. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Venkata. Uh, can we get Abdul Hasib, please? Okay, we have Revati. Revati, uh, can you hear us? Can somebody unmute Revati? Uh, yes, I, I can hear you. Go ahead, Revati. Please ask your question. Uh, first of all, thank you for your discussion. I got a like I learned a lot as a student. Uh, so my question is uh, very naive, and uh, but I would still like to ask. It is that uh, how has propaganda played a major role in the crisis, as well as what form of hybrid warfare are we seeing in this war? That's that is it. Well, uh, yeah. Well, Revati, this is the first full-fledged hybrid war of the 21st century. And I, what is the meaning of hybrid? And the meaning of hybrid is that in addition to the traditional military means of war, uh, you know, which we normally understand of planes, tanks, infantry and all, there are the contextual factors also in war which are not visible, but uh, they are also part of the conflict. Cyber is definitely one of them. I think both sides are engaged in uh, cyber attacks. Uh, so that is one. There is a very strong information war going on. Uh, the war, uh, a lot of effort has gone into creating uh, an impression um, with respect to uh, the public space, uh, the social media. Um, there are a lot of videos coming out. Uh, uh, there's a lot of technology that is available. Everybody has a cell phone. Uh, so therefore, every citizen in Ukraine is now a mini war correspondent. Um, and there is so, and there is in fact uh, information. I would say there is a over flood of information. So I think for analysts like us, uh, shifting to that information, I think is very important. Uh, we can safely assume that what is, what is available in the public space is not 100% correct. Uh, we have to use our uh, sense of common sense, a sense of realism, shift through the material, shift through the images that are being seen and, and, and get a good and more accurate picture. But definitely uh, information warfare is uh, the, the fight for uh, the public space, uh, the public support. Um, uh, all over the world, not just con confined to Ukraine or to Europe, is definitely one big dimension of this hybrid warfare that we are uh, that we are playing out, and that is playing being played out now. Great, uh, thanks, Ambassador Verma. Can we uh, bring in Aman? Uh, this will be our last question. Uh, I have an interesting question or an interesting story which which we should hear from. Uh, both our ambassadors from their experience. So we'll have Aman and then we'll have the experience sharing and then we'll end. Aman. Hello, sir. I'm audible. Yes. Sir, my question is what will be impact of recent quiet meeting on Russia-Ukraine conflict? And the uh, uh, question on sanction is that are these sanctions on Russia by West is temporary and can it lead to rec recession? Thank you, sir. Ambassador Kruti, impact on recession and so, impact being the recession. So, um, uh, what we are noticing is a unprecedented um, 
channelizing of economic tools uh, in the diplomatic toolbox. Uh, these are sharp tools. Um, uh, and uh, these are tools which hurt. Uh, you may not uh, realize it um, because these are not in the form of uh, military equipment or military means, but they can perhaps hurt in other ways. Uh, and it's clear they are intended to hurt. Uh, so I don't know whether it will lead to recession or not, but it will certainly impact on Russia's economy in multiplicity of ways, despite the, uh, the Russian uh, government uh, trying to insulate itself um, from such measures through uh, efforts that it had taken um, prior to the conflict. For example, uh, they had moved their reserves to places where they could not be sanctioned so easily. Um, and we are still in the beginning of what seems to be a longer pathway. Uh, so just um, uh, remember that wars are not addressed and solved in very quick succession. Um, I remember the Gulf War when Desert Storm started. Uh, it took 40 days for a huge coalition of countries uh, to tackle um, uh, Iraq and to push it back. Uh, we are still in the 14th day or the 15th day of a conflict. Uh, it is likely this conflict could be prolonged and its implications are, as Ambassador Verma said, uh, uncertain because we are all in uncharted territory and uh, only soothsayers can say something about uncharted territory. We are not there yet. Um, so uh, we can only indicate the trajectory and that trajectory is very worrisome in terms of impact on the Russian economy, uh, the world's economy, because the reverberations are being felt everywhere. So we need to gird up for a situation where the impact, economic impact will be severe in many places. Great. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Guruji. Now I'll come to a very interesting section before we end. This is where we, we learn from your experience. Uh, an interesting an anecdote, Ambassador Verma, from your uh, you know, vast experience of being in the field, uh, dealing with issues on a daily basis. One anecdote which you'd like, love to share uh, with, with our audience here today. Well, uh, uh, I worked in Russia three times over a period of three decades. Uh, and of course, the warmth of the friendship is uh, been there throughout. And let me tell you an episode about uh, uh, the event that we organized in 2019, which was uh, the 90th birth uh, anniversary of Raj Kapoor. And uh, as you know, Raj Kapoor still is a very strong memory in, uh, in, in Russia. He's hugely popular, but he's also a symbol of our, of our friendship. So we invited the embassy, organized a function for veterans of the Russian armed forces, you know, people who are 80 years old, 85 years old. And uh, they all came and we invited uh, in, uh, in, in this uh, movie, Miranam Joker, you, all, of you have, all of us have seen Raj Kapoor sing the song, but there's also a Russian actress in that. So we invited the family of that, uh, of that Russian actress to come for that function. And we had some songs being uh, narrated. Uh, they're sung by some Indian artists. But along with the Indian artists, the entire audience, which was completely Russian, which was Russian army veterans of the age of 80 to 85 to 90, all knew the full lyrics of uh, uh, the songs from uh, the Raj Kapoor era. So that was... Uh, that shows that our friendship is not just between governments and uh, uh, and uh, um, and ministers and uh, uh, and uh, the new generation, but also it spans several generations, and it is a friendship that is goes deep into the hearts 
of the people of both Russia and India. So I would like to end on that note as a very positive, heartwarming remembrance of my, my stay in Moscow. Great, uh, Ambassador Akhrudin. So uh, my anecdote is of um, my um, a stint in the United Nations as a young first secretary. And uh, when um, um, conflict happens, um, like now, uh, even when uh, I was young, I wanted to know what is this? Is it a war? Is it an invasion? Is it a conflict? Is it an outbreak of hostilities? There was an instance. I will not get into what that instance was, but there was an instance of such a situation. So I went to a very senior diplomat who was their foreign minister of a country and then had become their ambassador to the UN. And I answered, I asked him, ambassador, um, I'm young. This is the first time I'm uh, in this situation. Uh, can you explain to me what is this? Is this a war? Is this something else uh, on this? Explain to me. And he then smiled at that time. Smoking was not a bad thing, so he took out his cigar, took a puff, waved, and said, young man, I give you one way to assess these things, not anything else, not the news, not what people are saying, not what their presidents and others are saying, only one way. And I said, oh, tell me, what is this great solution that you have? He said, abductive reasoning. And he said, always test these things through the duck example. He said, if something walks like a duck, swims like a duck, um, uh, um, uh, moves around like a duck, then what is it? It's a duck. So don't be carried away by what everybody says. What is the abductive reason for it? Follow it. A duck is a duck is a duck. You can call it by any other name, but in this instance, there was fog of war. We weren't certain what it is, but we saw that it was a duck. And we need to call it for what it was as Ambassador Verma started it. It's a war. It's a conflict. It's an invasion. You call it by whatever name. It's clearly a breach of international law. And I, this was my first lesson in diplomacy at the UN, and it comes in handy time and again. So that's what I want to share with you. Always apply the duck example. Well, at this point, uh, the only duck I can think about is the sitting duck in Ukraine. People are getting hammered uh, in their own country. I hope uh, normalcy is restored to the world. Uh, it's been two years. We you know, deserve some normalcy in the world uh, for a change and we should you know, live in peace. Hope uh, you know, uh, this message of peace goes far and wide. Thank you so much uh, for everybody who joined us today. Thank you to our panelists, Ambassador Verma, Ambassador Akburuddin, and the entire team which organized this session. Uh, we routinely organize uh, Let's Talk Policy based, uh, on a monthly basis on topics which are current, which are of, of importance. Uh, so I invite you to keep following us on social media and join us for each and every Let's Talk Policy session. On that note, uh, good night and have a peaceful uh, you know, day ahead. Bye-bye.